FAO is proud to present Mr. Douglas Ratley. So, uh, good afternoon. Um, I only have seven minutes, so I'm going to start right in with my presentation. What is pyrolysis oil? Well, pyrolysis is a process uh, that you can make from just about any biomass feedstock, uh, including wood fibers, sugarcane, bagasse, palm fruit bunches, for example. A Dynamotive uh, tested 128 different feedstocks, successfully making pyrolysis oil. Uh, you introduce uh, particles of biomass in a reactor at 500 degrees Celsius, and it vaporizes in less than two seconds. You then condense it into a liquid oil, char, and non-condensable gases. The characteristics of pyrolysis oil, you get around 60 to 70% yield depending on the feedstock. It's a liquid biofuel. It can be stored, pumped, and transported, but it is not a transportation fuel. It is slightly acidic with a pH of around two to three, which is about the same as household vinegar. And it has an energy value of 18 gigajoules per ton, which is about half that of fossil oil. In terms of production to date, they've been making pyrolysis oil since 1989. Uh, most of it in the United States and Wisconsin. They have several plants there that have been producing around 50,000 tons, all uh, with Ensign technology. Uh, Ensign built its own uh, plant in Canada in 2006. So from that time, we've had a, a steady average of around 75,000 tons. Dynamotive got into the business for four or five years uh, from 2007 till 2010, building the new world's largest pyrolysis oil plants but the company foundered due to financial difficulties during the recession. The big story is the huge increase in the uh, amount of production and announcements as of today. Uh, in 2014, uh, Fortin built the new world's largest pyrolysis oil plant in Joensuu, Finland. The Empero plant in the Netherlands is under construction, as I believe the Battelle uh, plant is in Dryden, Ontario. And Ensign and others have announced several other plants to be built in the next couple of years. Uh, in terms of market evolution, uh, since 1989, uh, Red Arrow has been using pyrolysis oil in the renewable food and chemicals market. Uh, it began uh, replacing oil in its plants in 2004 for building heat. Uh, in 2009, Dynamotive was successful in feeding uh, pyrolysis oil into a uh, Arenda turbine uh, to make power, which it fed into the Ontario grid. In 2013, uh, Ensign was successful in feeding uh, pyrolysis oil into diesel engines, so that will be its new business model uh, to make power uh, from diesel engines. But as of now, the markets will basically be replacing oil in power stations, replacing oil in district heating systems, and even replacing natural gas in these systems where pyrolysis oil is competitive, or if uh, power plants and district heating plants want to wean themselves of uh, Russian natural gas, for example. Uh, you can also use a pyrolysis oil uh, to replace oil in residential furnaces and commercial buildings. Um, in the future, uh, and in the not too distant future, proven but uh, not at the commercial scale, is using pyrolysis oil as a feedstock for renewable fuels. Okay, so what will be the first markets for new production? Um, generally, it will be the large power and district heating plants and large industries especially those on coasts. Uh, the reasons are that it requires the least supply chain requirements and that all production of, of any one plant can usually go to one customer. This market is around 30 million tons oil equivalent. The largest you can see on the left is um, uh, in France replacing oil and power plants, in Italy replacing oil and power plants, uh, and so on down the line. These markets are in excess of 2 million tons per country. Um, you can see that Denmark, for example, district heating, uh, they use around uh, 900,000 tons, which seems like a small market, but in fact, it's the equivalent of 16 world-scale pyrolysis oil plants. So you can see the market is quite large. The second markets will be residential and commercial, and this market is around 50 million tons. Um, the current oil supply chain, uh, oil is uh, sent to terminals at transportation hubs, usually in big cities or in ports. It goes by rail or truck to regional fuel storage tanks, and then distributors truck the, the uh, oil to home, the home oil tanks, and uh, the oil is uh, used to, uh, to heat water in a boiler, which goes into piping and heats, heats uh, rooms and homes. The same thing will happen with pyrolysis oil, and probably with the same companies. 
The only difference is that the companies will use stainless steel rail cars and tanks and trucks. Now, even though it requires a supply chain change, uh, this is not uh, uh, abnormal for history. Several times, entire supply chains have had to change. Uh, homes were uh, uh, heated by wood, and then uh, they changed to coal, either to price or to convenience. Uh, eventually, of course, coal changed oil, which caused another complete change in the supply chain system. And again, from oil to natural gas and oil to wood pellets. The same thing will happen with uh, oil and natural gas to renewable pyrolysis oil, but it will be less of a change than those experienced in the past. In terms of uh, competitiveness of pyrolysis oil, um, the blue bars that you see are the prices that various markets pay for fossil fuel. For example, on the far left, uh, Sweden district heating uh, plants pay around $31 uh, dollars, yes, US dollars per gigajoule uh, and so on down the line. The green area is the cost that uh, it would be to bring pyrolysis oil delivered Rotterdam from various places uh, uh, in, uh, on earth. Uh, and the price, uh, delivered price would be anywhere from nine and a half dollars per gigajoule to around 16 or 17 dollars per gigajoule. So you can see that pyrolysis oil doesn't even need uh, government incentives. In many markets, it's already competitive on a price basis. The red lines you see are the prices of oil uh, estimated as of around a week ago. So you can see that even though the cost of oil is down, there are many markets that where pyrolysis oil is still competitive. And it's my contention that uh, prices of oil will end up probably somewhere between the red line and the blue line, which keeps open many markets. So you can make pyrolysis oil in the EU with EU biomass, but imports are often going to be the better uh, choice. How are we going to get the volumes? Well, this is just one strategy that we're looking at. Um, we're planning to build four or five uh, pyrolysis oil plants on rail lines in northwestern Ontario, where there's lots of uh, uh, excess biomass from the foundering uh, uh, forest products industry. Uh, it will be shipped by rail to the port of Trois-Rivières on the St. Lawrence and then shipped to Europe. So how are we going to afford all this? I'm putting together with German and UK partners a 200 million biotrade fund, which will invest in biomass densification plants, such as pellets and pyrolysis oil, and associated supply chains, such as rail cars, trucks, and port storage, to ensure that the pyrolysis oil can be delivered to customers in Europe uh, at a competitive rate. Uh, we plan to uh, raise capital in 2015 and invest in 2016 to 2020. Where will we be investing in pyrolysis oil? Canada, United States, Australia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Africa, amongst others. Okay, so you've seen that pyrolysis oil production is taking off as a product. The EU markets alone are almost 80 million tons oil equivalent. There are many markets that do not even need government incentives, like pellets need incentives, uh, and that pyrolysis oil can be competitive even after the oil price collapse. Imports will be supported by the instigation